Yeah, so that was Clara Davis, and uh, she had these 15 infants given up for adoption at birth. She ran the study for six years, six years. There were 34 foods available uh, seasonally, and so they didn't offer all 34 all at once, but they would offer a good mix of foods that were available seasonally. And then uh, she instructed the people that were helping her, do not give a hint of what what uh, the the children should eat. And then she describes... You know, early on, they sampled everything. They would sample, everything went into the mouth, including napkins and silverware, whatever was <laughs> on their little thing. That, but then she said for each each child, they would begin to focus in on a certain subset that worked for them. And that's where we were talking earlier. Uh, no two children ever selected the same combinations of foods. No child ever selected the same foods from day to day, but they all selected a diet that led to, to health. And, I was reading some of the papers that pediatrician who was working with her on that study published. They said they'd never seen a healthier set of children ever, you know. So, again, it's it's this idea that there is a wisdom of the of the body that resides in each one. It's unique to each individual in terms of how it's manifest as a function of the needs of, of each individual and, and what what works for them. And, uh, yeah, it was a... Uh, it was a really a marvelous study and when you read some of what she said about just the comments the way that she wrote and the things that she would say about those uh the study and the children it, it was uh it was an amazing piece of work i wish she was still still alive she she said in one of her papers that they had hoped and this started you know you think back in the 30s i don't tend to think so much of process back then but she said that had started and they wanted to actually do a study uh, offering the children processed foods as a part of, of the whole thing. But the, the depression hit and uh, so forth and so on. They couldn't do it. But I think we have a pretty good idea how that experiment. Oh, yeah. Well, that experiment is playing out now. <laughs> yes. <Yeah. laughs> it's very obvious. Eat human. Les humains à leur meilleur. C'est toi pour hell. All right, here we are, another Peak Human podcast. I'm Brian Sanders. Thanks for sharing with a friend, starting back at episode one and giving us a review on iTunes or the podcast app. I have an amazing episode for you today with Fred Provenza, PhD. He's a legend. He's come up on my show so many times back in the Gay Brown episode, Mark Schatzker episode, more recently with Stefan Van Vliet, the other PhD that he does research with. I'm sure more times than that, he's done amazing research for decades decades on animal intelligence, how they know what to eat, how they can feed themselves through their innate intelligence about what their body needs, about what plants can give them that, and how what plants they eat can give us better nutrition through their meat, through all the compounds, through the 70,000 compounds that we are just discovering that are in meat. This is the metabolomic stuff that Dr. Stefan Van Vliet spoke about on the previous episode of this podcast. They're doing a bunch of new science with mass spectronomy to look at all these secondary compounds to find out why there is a difference between different kinds of meat, stuff that's been raised on diverse pastures and stuff that's been fed a monocrop diet in a feedlot. There is a difference and also a difference between fake meat and real meat, which we actually didn't get too much into, but it's also part of their studies. We can include some of those in the show notes, but just such a great episode with Fred. He's been doing this forever. He's the man. It's a long one. You might have to listen in chunks. That's how I do it. I'd rather go long, get all the good info. I feel like this audience can handle that. They don't need some short, high-level info. We want to go deep. He really is focused on quality meat and how we can get the best nutrition from animal foods. Even though we spent a lot of time talking about foraging and other plants, it really is about getting all of those nutrients into the animal so we can eat their meat. Listen to the end. We talk about some cool stuff like our decentralized food project that I mentioned on social media. I do have that landing page now. It's sovereignhumans.org. You can check that out. We also bring up nose to tail.org, which is my regenerative meat company that everyone should know about by now. 
you can order some for yourself at nosetail.org. As we talked about in the episode, the best way to get the best nutrients is to have a diverse diet on rangeland. It's exactly what we do. Check out the video with Jessica and Austin. Those are my beef producers with my new nose to tail operation. You can find it on the Food Lies YouTube channel. They have been doing this stuff since the late 80s. They, the grandpa took the Alan Savory course on holistic management. They've been using a diverse rangeland diet, rotational grazing, all the right practices to get the healthiest meat possible while regenerating the land. You can get that at nosetail.org. Now, some more about my guest. Fred Provenza grew up in Salida, Colorado, working on a ranch while attending school in wildlife biology at Colorado State University. He is Professor Emeritus of Behavioral Ecology in the Department of Wildland Resources at Utah State University, where he worked for 35 years, directing an award-winning research group that pioneered an understanding of how learning influences foraging behavior and how behavior links soil, plants, herbivores, and humans. He's one of the founders of BEHAVE, an international network of scientists, ranchers, farmers, and land managers committed to integrating behavioral principles with local knowledge to enhance environmental, economical, and cultural values of rural and urban communities. He is the author of three books, including Nourishment, What Animals Can Teach Us About Rediscovering Our Nutritional Wisdom, Foraging Behavior, Managing to Survive in a World of Change, and The Art and Science of Shepherding tapping the wisdom of French herders. He has published over 300 research papers in a wide variety of scientific journals. He has been an invited speaker at over 500 conferences. The many awards he received for research, teaching, and mentoring are the creativity that flowed from warm professional and personal relationships with over 75 graduate students, postdoctoral students, visiting scientists, and colleagues during the past 45 years. Man, this guy is awesome. Please enjoy this episode. Please check out nosetail.org to support the show and get yourself some good regenerative meat. And we'll see you next week. All right, Fred Provenza, how are you doing? I know you're in Montana. You're you're in a blizzard, I hear. Yeah, we're in Montana. And since Sunday night, we've been in a full-blown blizzard. Well, I want to hear more about it, but I'll give a little more context. I did a little intro before this, but you're a PhD. You were at Utah State University for 35 years. You were in the Department of Wildland Resources. You've come up on my podcast a lot. People should know the name Fred Provenza. I'm trying to remember all the times we brought you up. I'm sure it was with uh, Dr. Stephen Stefan Van Vliet, who you did some papers with recently, probably with Mark Schatzker, who wrote the book, The Dorito Effect. And uh, yeah, I'm sure many other times, um, maybe Peter Ballerstadt. Uh, what, so why don't you introduce yourself a little bit more about your career? I guess we could start out with interest from when I was a tiny kid, basically anything wild fascinated me, whether it was insects, fishes, birds, mammals, I was just enthralled by them, literally just fascinated with that. That never went away. And when I finished high school, I often tell people in high school and for many years after that, there were really only three seasons for me, hunting, fishing, and skiing. That was pretty much it. I survived the end of one only because the next one was coming around. So when it came time to go to college, I thought, well, I'll go to Colorado State University and major in wildlife biology. That sounds like a neat thing to major in. And it was. I loved it. Back in the days, it was very hands-on kind of uh, schooling at and uh, learned about all these different kind of creatures and the ecological ecological facets of, of how they live and survive. But at the same time, and this was totally unexpected, I was working on a ranch in Colorado and I worked there for seven years. I say unexpected because I wasn't born and raised on a ranch, um, <clears throat> but when I was a senior in high school, I had a friend who said, you wanna make some extra money in the evenings and on the weekends? We can haul hay at Henry DeLuca's. We'll make eight cents a bale. We'll split it, four cents a piece. Went out there and did that and found I loved it, just loved it. And so where during high school, I'd worked in a greenhouse uh, during the summer vacations. I started working on the ranch uh, when I went to college and was out there for seven years. So that combination for me really, uh, so many things happened on the ranch, honestly, just hands-on uh hands-on kind of working with plants with animals goat sheep cattle pigs ducks you name it geese um and it just it so perked my interest in many of the things that we ended up studying um and 
that in combination with what was going on at Colorado State University was just, uh, you know, that's really the foundation for me of, of the interest and in learning about things. And then 35 years of, as Henry DeLuca used to say when he talked about cattle that didn't know the country, said they just don't know the range. That's really, I think, that's what we studied for 35 years. What does it mean for an animal to know the range? That's mm. wild or domestic animal. I love that. Yeah, you've touched a lot of sides of animal forage, like animal diets, and then kind of recently translated that into human diets with Professor Van Vliet, which is really cool. Also, I remember you probably came up on Gabe Brown, too. Gabe Brown um, probably mentioned to you a lot on, on the episode I did with him. He's a great holistic farmer, uh, rancher, actually. Well, both. Yeah, and Gabe, so, Gabe has really <clears throat> done uh, – I met Gabe many, many, many years ago when I was doing a workshop – out in uh, North Dakota, I guess it was, doing a few-day workshop, and uh, Gabe was there and met, got to know him a long, long, long time ago, and I remember one evening we had had some wonderful, wonderful sit around the table and just brainstorm based on some of the things that we were talking about there, uh, very much about, you know, what does it mean for animals to be locally adapted to the landscapes that, that they inhabit, and what all you know, things that you would never expect. For instance, we were talking just prior to, to going on air about this blizzard that's here now. And I often think of the animals and, uh, you know, what do they do? How do they survive these intense kind of 30, 40 mile an hour driving snow for day after day? And, uh, you know, they're amazing, really. And so th this wisdom that they have in their body, and I, I was thinking about studies that were done probably in the 70s at Utah State, where people were, were simply monitoring what cattle did on landscapes, when they foraged, how long they foraged uh, seasonally. And during the fall and uh, winter, when storms like this would come in, what they found was that when the barometric pressure dropped, ahead of a storm so before the storm ever hit this is the key point the animals started to forage like mad they just bulked up bulked up bulked up during the storm they found the best places they could be to be out of the cold and the wind and the snow pretty amazing huh to me that, that those are the kind of wisdoms that are in a body that, that we were studying that let you know well how do they do it and then who would i mean it makes perfect sense right if you can somehow be alerted before a storm, your body senses that, which their bodies were doing, and then you, you bulk up before the storm even hits while there's still no snow covering the ground, no intense cold. It's, uh, to me, those kind of things were, were fascinating and amazing, and it's what we spent 35 years studying is how animals do it, how they make a living. And then for Gabe, and I saw him <clears throat> a few weeks ago, and we were talking about these kind of things, and he just said how much that had, he appreciated that, uh, you know, as he moved into what he was doing, that ability of animals to know what to do and then letting them do what they, what they can do, you know, how, uh, rather than supplementing them with, with hay and on and on and on, all these fossil fuel intensive practices, let animals be animals, but realize that they're learning, that genes are being expressed, that we got into a lot of work like that on how genes are being expressed that allow different organ systems to, to utilize the foods that are available in the environment. And so if you if you're always supplementing them and providing food, the body learns that, right? If you aren't, you can raise animals that are really locally adapted to living on what nature provides. So now I'm spewing on along with that, but I, I think it's pretty, it's pretty amazing, all of that, actually. And it has practical, practical implications for how to reduce the costs of, of farming and ranching and so forth. No, I'm glad you gave us this over overview because it really it does kind of say what you've studied over the past 35 years and more beyond just your career there. You're still going. You're retired now, still going. And it's about this innate wisdom of animals. And I think that's a recurring theme where, and that's why you've been brought up on my show many times, because we're talking about studies that you've been a part of that animals know what to eat. 
based on if they're deficient, we'll, we'll jump into all this stuff. But the, the high level thing is what you're talking about. There is so much innate wisdom in animals. They sense things. They sense their environment. They know their bodies. They know different plants and forages they need to eat. If they're deficient in something, they know the, the stuff about the, the blizzard is so interesting because you, you mentioned the barometric pressure. I mean, that must be something that they can sense. And that helps them survive, right? They've had to develop this ability to sense this. And I think even humans have this. That's another theme of your work over the years is that humans have this as well, but we've lost it. So you're, it's so perfect that you've made this recap. The animals have lost it because we've put them into intensive feeding operations and we just don't let them control their own destiny, you know, you could say. And then humans are a domesticated creature now. And so we've lost our wisdom. And if you're... That's probably why you came up on the Mark Schatzer podcast with the Dorito effect. We have all the fake flavorings. So now we can't make our own decisions based on our you know, innate wisdom of what our body needs because it's been hijacked by the fake foods and the fake chemicals and flavorings. So we don't know what we need now. Yeah, well said, Brian. That's absolutely it. And so one could think, um, you know, in domestic animals, uh, the idea was when we started our work that uh, they had lost this inherent wisdom as a result of 10,000 years of domestication. You know, we've, we've been selecting for different breeds and so forth, and we, we just bred that out of them. And then uh, with the obesity crisis and all that's happening with we humans, why that's the same idea. Well, if there's a wisdom to the body, how... <laughs> We're not seeing it, right? But you nailed it, I think, when you said, in a way, uh, in a very real way, it's been hijacked in humans. And we were talking about the ultra-processed foods and the, and the absolute, um, our inability to, to resist them, actually. And that happening, the development of that whole industry happening at the same time, that in the fruits and vegetables and the meats that we were producing, we were really selecting for yield as opposed to nutritional density, right? For, or what I like to say in plants and, and in meat, phytochemical richness, all these different compounds that plants produce that promote health, we selected against all that. And so we really shot ourselves in the foot from the human standpoint, from the domesticated goat, sheep, and cattle standpoint, um, we, we moved away from giving them choice and ability to choose, um, you know, having a variety of different foods available. I often like to say, kind of summing up uh, a lot related to this, that, and putting it in the uh, current context of the importance of soil, that plants turn dirt into soil and diverse mixtures of plants turn soil into homes, grocery stores, and pharmacies for herbivores, omnivores, and carnivores below ground and above ground. To me, that summarizes everything I ever learned in ecology and not being disrespectful, but that's what, that's what it is. Well, if you take away the homes, the grocery stores, and the pharmacies uh, from animals, and then you um, don't allow them to be born and raised and to rear their offspring, and you break those transgenerational linkages that really um, make animals locally adapted to the landscapes they inhabit, then you've hijacked that wisdom too, much as we talk for, for humans and what's happened with ultra-processed foods over the last decades. I love the, the connection that, I heard you talk about this before, that it, nature is the pharmacy for animals and they know where to go. And yes, we block them off. If you don't allow them access to certain types of forage or you, yeah, you put them into a feedlot or you do other things, they don't have access to that pharmacy. Why don't you tell me more just about that analogy or just reality that that the, the natural world and all the plants that an animal can access is its pharmacy? Yes, I, I love, <clears throat> love this topic. And, uh, you know, when I was a young grad student and prior to that, <clears throat> people in wildlife and people in, in range science studying 
domestic animals on on rangelands were like me we, we were all really interested what do they eat you know what do they eat and where do they go just basic kind of just go, probably sounds boring but to us it was interesting you know to go out and try to figure out what is it that they're eating and so there were a ton of papers published with titles like um <clears throat> The botanical and chemical characteristics of animal X on landscape Y at time Z. And you know, mm-hmm. I mean, there were just a, and but it was amazing. And wildlife folks were doing that too. And you would see um, that maybe three to five plants would make up the bulk of a meal in uh, you know at any one meal. But throughout the day, they would nibble on. You know, if it was a really diverse landscape, 25, 50, maybe 75 species. And I remember that well, because when you're trying to do diet analyses, you have to sort out what all those species are, whether it's fecal analysis or if you're doing other kind of techniques. And so, you know, there are a lot of species. It was hard to identify them and so forth. So, but the point I'm winding around to is that we emphasized the three to five that were the bulk of the diet in those days, and importantly, because, you know, that is um, where their energy and protein and minerals and so forth are coming from. But we didn't think so much about the other 25, 50, 75 that were in there. As I went along in my career, I came to think, you know, those matter every bit as much as as the other plants in there because they're providing all these let's say micronutrients or what I I refer to as phytochemicals. Plants obviously have energy, protein, minerals, and so forth, but they produce this tremendous array of other kind of compounds that originally were referred to as waste products of plant metabolism. When people, by chemists, started studying plants, they didn't know, well, what roles do they play, you know? And then they came to be known as secondary compounds, and now we understand that they're they're absolutely essential to the the health and survival not only of plants but of all these other creatures in the environment. So these broad classes like alkaloids and phenolics and terpenes that have you know tens of thousands of of different individual compounds. Um, We've come now to appreciate their their important roles in in health at a cellular level. I often think like this, you know. I think cells, I think, are conscious, and uh, they they but they can only forage on what's available in the capillaries. And so, you know, if they've got this diverse array of compounds to forage on, they can maintain their health, right? You think where cancer starts, it starts with a cell, with a single cell. Well, we know these compounds now uh, can counter all the seven hallmarks of cancer if a cell has access to that, right? Whether that's a domestic animal or a human being. And so, um, and that's where then we can think when animals are eating this diverse array of different plants, they really are self-medicating prophylactically, preventatively um, by doing that. And so, you know, when you move away from a monoculture pasture or a feedlot diet to these diverse rangeland diets, you don't need to provide um, medications to animals because they're they're really um, medicating preventatively, prophylactically on those landscapes. But we know beyond that, too, that whether it's insects or uh, birds or fish or mammals, uh, including the domestic animals, they can learn to self-medicate. Uh, to When they get sick, they can learn to self-medicate. And there's such a rich literature that's developed on that. I have a friend, Mike Huffman, in uh, Japan who's done you know, for, for throughout his career, some amazing work with primates, and he often is featured, and for, for good reason. For, you know, he's just got endless stories uh, and data to show the ability of primates to self-medicate. Well, we got interested in that for domestic animals and showed the same thing, that they, that they can self-medicate. And beyond that, that they can use different medicines to rectify different kind of illnesses. So it's it's like we do. If you have a headache, 
probably go and take an aspirin. If you have a stomach ache, maybe Pepto-Bismol. And I, I don't need to get into the details on that unless you'd want to, but, but that is the key point that we showed in some, in some really nice studies we did that they can associate different medicines with different kinds of illnesses. So there's all these different kind of internal states that they obviously become aware of and know how to how to uh, rectify in the case of, of maladies. When it comes to nutrients, as you said earlier too, we did so many studies with energy initially, then with protein, then with energy protein ratios, then with minerals, um, and then colleagues in Australia worked with vitamins, and all showing that um, if animals become deficient in any of those, and not severely deficient even, but if they become a bit deficient, they and they've learned the landscape, then they can know, you know, I need to eat plant this plant or that plant or something else. So it's all, it was all, all the work was pointing in that direction of, uh, of this wisdom of the body. And uh, let me say one more thing about that. There, there are really three legs to that stool. And if you break any one of those legs, it's not going, you won't get nutritional wisdom manifest. We've talked about one up to this point, the diverse array of different plant species, so important. <clears throat> the second one would be mother as a transgenerational link. Mother's knowledge of what and what not to eat, where and where not to go, what's a predator, what's not a predator, that becomes just vital for, for, for domestic animals at least, and many other species as well, for them to be able to, to, to survive. And, you know, we know that the fetal taste system is fully functional during the last trimester of gestation. So the flavors of foods that mother eats, and we and others have shown this, get into the amniotic fluid. The young creature is already starting to learn what's food before it ever gets in the environment. After birth, flavors in mother's milk also become cues, and then mother as a model. And so we were showing these different ways that, that they get linked transgenerationally in, in really tangible ways. And then you can think of, you know, um, if animals, <clears throat> this having animals that know the range becomes so important. So that's the second link. The third link has to do with these metabolically mediated feedbacks and that they're coming from cells and organ systems. And it's really um, how cells and organ systems um, feed back to change liking for the flavor of foods as a function of need. It's a very basic kind of, of system that simply alters liking as a function of what the animal needs. And they learn to associate different, different foods with different kind of consequences. And then all that's being mediated by uh, neurotransmitters, peptides, hormones, and so forth and so on, things we, we don't need to get into. But no, it's I think it's key to realize there's those three legs to the stool and we've broken them all with humans as we were alluding to earlier and we did that um, in many ways with with domestic animals and i think becoming aware of those linkages then helps us to think about how how to enable the wisdom of the body and with us as well as domestic animals how to reduce the costs of production, so to speak. You know, I mean, the downstream effects of eating ultra-processed foods are incredibly costly for us as a people. So if we were to be eating wholesome foods and allowing the wisdom of the body to be manifest, all the medical costs that come about as a result of poor diets would go away. Wow. Yeah, I mean, I'm, I'm right there with you. That, yeah, that's my main message is wake up to that. You change your diet, change your lifestyle, and you, you can avoid the whole medical system altogether. But all this stuff you just said is endlessly fascinating to me. The, I love the wisdom that animals had to do to self-medicate. And you kind of got started getting into some of the mechanisms of why that even works. But how would it be any other way? How would all these animals exist? Right. If they didn't have that ability, they didn't always have veterinarians and, you know, feedlot owners, you know, <laughs> coming around and like giving them different things. And this is also how humans work. This is I went to Africa. 
I, I haven't brought it up in a while. I try to uh, I bring it up like every episode, <laughs> but I, I took a little break. So I went to Africa in February. I spent time with hunter gatherers, Hadza, Maasai, and the Pygmies and Uganda, the Bawa. They didn't have doctors. They don't have orthodontists. They have perfect teeth. They have perfect teeth and uh, near perfect health without doctors, without dentists, without orthodonture, without all these things that we have. It's because we do have this innate wisdom. It's because it's been handed down through genetics, epigenetics, even through the fetal uh, pathways that you were just talking about. And we should get into how that's affecting humans too with uh, the, the diets of the mothers and how they can already be screwed from birth with uh, the ultra processed foods. But we, we animals have this ability to survive without the modern systems that we have. And that's, of course, how else would we exist? Like, and people deny it. This is what I get so mad about is people in the modern day are so lost that they, they don't realize that this is how humans have always been. Like Facebook and Instagram blocked the hashtag natural immunity. They blocked the hashtag natural immunity. This is insane to me, insane. And we're, we're at a, such a crazy place in society that we forgot that that humans have this ability, animals have this ability to know what they need to, to survive. And now there's a few of us, probably all the people listening, that we've just woken up to the old day, the old days, the old ways, the old, right? All we're, we're, just, we're just rediscovering what humans already knew. I, I love it. I'm on the same page as you. And you know, when we were starting our work 35 years ago or so, I, uh, I used to write review papers, and I used to make that same argument. How else could it be? How else could that be? There weren't uh, veterinarians. There weren't uh, pharmacists, on, on and on and on. They, they didn't exist for us or for other creatures. So how else could it, how else could it be? Somehow we knew. And, you know, in those days, we scientists were battering it around like you usually do. And, and there was this idea, well, maybe just by chance alone, you know, if you eat enough things by chance alone, it'll happen. But, um, you know, I think our work and, you know, we published 250, 300 papers. I don't know how, how many by now, a ton, um, you know, over and over again, we were, we were making the case. It's not chance. This isn't chance. They, they, they know how in the ways that we're talking, animals know how to figure this out. And we do, too. We still have that. You know, in the sense that you say, how else could it be something so fundamental to survival? I mean, everything is built on that, right? If you don't eat right, you don't reproduce. Um, your species doesn't stay in the, the game. So that's so fundamental. So I think we still, as you were saying, Brian, we still have that wisdom, too. And then it's realizing how easily it can be hijacked. And, you know, I remember years ago attending conferences, and they were fascinating in a way different from how I look at it now, but, but nonetheless still fascinating. And it would be, we would gather at uh, conferences in different places around the globe, and people who were interested in this topic, everything from insects to humans, and some of the people who spoke about humans, you know, we were all talking about the same principles and processes. That's what was fun. And we didn't care the implications per se, weren't in the sense that you and I are talking right now, weren't so upfront. It's just the principles and the processes. How's this work? And, and what do different people do? But I remember being absolutely fascinated listening to people that worked with humans, that were doing the human work from industry. You know? <laughs> and, is we were all talking the same principles and processes. We were all, we all understood that. And I used to think, you know, nobody really cares about a sheep or a goat or a cow or what I'm, I'm talking about. They did. I, I, so, I, I, but, but in the sense that where the money is, is with humans. That's what used to strike me as, man, if you want to be where the money is, that's where, that's where people really care about this stuff. And here I'm studying sheep and goats and cows and actually happy to be doing that. The more I see the human part of things, boy, that's, that's, uh, that's craziness. But, um, 
But it was fascinating. It was just fascinating to listen to those folks give talks and to visit with them and to, and to see how 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 they would. There was no stone left unturned in terms of how they knew how to get us to eat what they the products. You know, basically, I'm telling you, from everywhere the way it's packaged to what's in that package, and that you would have talked with Mark Shackshire about quite a lot to where it goes on the grocery store shelf and on and on and on. I'm telling you, you we're defenseless. It's no wonder that the whole system has been, been hijacked. You're here utterly when the when you understand so much about how it works and how to do that. There's a video I like to show that we have with sheep and I'll send it to you, Brian. It's you know, we did a lot of workshops and uh, short courses over the years, and there was one two-week short course that was a delight to teach every day for two weeks. And we would ha hands-on be not just talking, but having people work with animals and see the things that you and I are talking about. And one was the feedback part of things, and we'd have, in this video, we had two groups of sheep, um, <clears throat> and it was in the morning. So they're coming uh, after an overnight fast, they're eating their breakfast, and uh, you see, one group of sheep is just absolutely devouring the straw. They love it. They love it. The other group sniffs it a little bit, then they walk over to the fence, and they're watching this other group like, what the hell are you doing? <laughs> Why do you like that? Well, the reason they liked it is we did just what the fast food industry does. After the group that loved the straw ate the straw, we <clears throat> took a stomach tube, and followed that with a blast of energy, basically. So for a human, that would be high fructose corn syrup, let's say, that's in mm -hmm. food or whatever. We, we, had, we had an energy source. And the other group, we simply drenched with water. And so every time I watch that video, I just think, you know, that's exactly what the fast food industry learned to do with tons of nuance. So then we could flavor the straw certain ways that are enticing. But it's that blast of energy. And when you watch those sheep, the one group just thinks it's fantastic, and the other group, and straw's not a great food. Animals aren't going to necessarily go for it, but these ones thought it was the greatest thing since, mm. what, I don't know, some diverse things. bread, plants. yeah, since uh, the ribeye. I don't like yeah. sliced bread. Yeah. I don't like that one. Uh, no, wait, so this is super interesting. So the control was, they didn't know, they didn't know that it, they didn't taste the blast of energy. You put this tube down them and they just got the blast of energy and that sent signals to their body that this is abundance this is energy this is good and they associated that in their brains to this straw is good that's absolutely it that's that so we were separating the flavor of the food the flavor of the straw which they're getting um in a sense from the the feedback um uh, just as the just the way you said it, don't want to confuse people. But the way we did that then is through the stomach tube, and you just deliver the blast of energy right into the gut, and so then that feedback is coming from the energy, and like you said, boy, this is great stuff. You know, we're like the cells are all screaming out, "This is great stuff," and uh, and so they they form a very very strong preference, and it happens quickly. You know, we do that a couple, two, three times, four times. And then, uh, like I say, I'll send you the video. It's it's. Uh, oh, I would like it's to see not it. Long, but it's powerful. You know, I mean, we're trying to put it. In, I'm trying to put it into words, and you're doing a nice job of saying it back. But when you see that and realize that the only difference is the feedback, one got the water, one got the the. Uh, but you know, I've often no, I won't go down that path. Yeah, but it's the feedback. It's the feed. Well, I was going to yeah. say. I've often thought, you know, if they were really, really thirsty for water, they would probably come to associate straw with a boost of water the way we did that. <laughs> but that's, you can yeah, delete that right. from our conversation. But, you know, that's that's what we would do is think about, well, what what might be happening? What might, how, how? and then we would devise study after study after study. And I think a key point, too, we were always asking the animal the question. We were always asking them the question and setting up the study so that they would tell us. And then we would learn, learn, we were learning from the animals in a very real sense. And sometimes what we thought was happening, um, they would, would reinforce that, yes, this mm -hmm. probably is happening. Sometimes, though, 
they didn't do what we thought. And so then it would make you stop in your tracks and think, I remember getting so frustrated sometimes. And then my wife would say, well, you're about to learn something, aren't you now? <laughs> and, you know, because you, then you have to really put the thinking cap on and think, well, okay, so this isn't, how I'm thinking about this is not right. So what's going on here, you know? And that was yeah. good, so but we were always asking the animal the question, always asking them the question. It sounds like you were doing real science instead of the science that happens in 2021 where they have the predetermined result they want or they don't they don't ask the questions and they don't like what you're talking about is not having the predetermined outcome and if if it, the science said something that you didn't expect you leaned into that and figured it out <laughs> I I feel like these days that's not how people do thing. science yeah, that's such so critical what what you're saying, Brian. And I used to always tell the students uh, that I was working with, you know, we follow whatever they, whatever wherever it leads us. We can't, um, boy. And you think what happens when you think? I guess to pick one person, Ansel Keys, and all the studies that came you know, the Minnesota study and some of those others where they buried the data because it didn't fit the hypothesis. And then look at the downstream effects on human beings of all that, right? That's, mm -hmm. yeah, that's, yeah, that's just totally disingenuous. Cool. And, uh, you know, that's where when you get away from trying to, as hard as that might be, what what is, quote, the truth? What is, you know, how do things actually work? And you try to follow that and, and see that as something you really think is valuable. When you throw all that out, um, well, science. You it's, it's, everything you, out, then you know you you the, and just yeah, you can use. We could use Ansel Keys and what happened with with food as a metaphor for a lot of what goes on uh, nowadays. I would say too, huh? I mean, when you, well, you, science is supposed to be about proving yourself wrong, and now absolutely. science is about censoring things. Like so, there there should be no censorship in science because if if you have a fact, then you should be, try to disprove it. You don't censor right. people. You welcome people trying to debunk your, quote, fact because you have the real science to prove it. And if it doesn't hold up to science, then you change your opinion. But that's not what happens anymore. No, that's so that's so fundamental what you're saying. And that's the idea. And the, and the other idea is that you can never really prove a theory. You can you can you can. And that's to keep it open in just the sense that you're talking. Right. You can't prove it. You can only disprove them. And so the idea is you, you do studies and then you would say, my findings are consistent with this, this theory, but it's not like you've proved it for once and for all, right? You, you, that, that's the idea that you're expressing nicely. You try to keep the thing open so that you never, um, you know, and you can think in physics, you think of that, I think of physics and in different disciplines where some of the, the theories that were, you know, long standing and highly regarded, but then somebody comes, gravity, Newton and gravity, and then Einstein comes up and says, well, you know, and he had great respect for Newton. Yeah, Newton works here on Earth. It works okay, but it's it's limited. It's 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 got limits. And so now we can think general theory of relativity is a better description for gravity across the universe. And then you can think in relativity's la we trying to keep open. I, mm -hmm. I well, think that's so so important what you're what we're saying right now. Of how how do you try to and how do you try to keep open? And in the human part of things, boy, you have different schools of thought that are so. We were talking about the different di the different diet views, huh? Where <laughs> if you yeah. Uh, omnivore and herbivore, and carnivore in, in the human diet and so forth and so on. Uh, you can well, get very strong schools of thought and then you can get literature that, that starts to uh, maybe myopically, a little too myopically focus on just one thing or another. Uh, this is the way that it is, period. And uh, and I, I, without saying names, I have to say that some of what I see people will rail on people from the old times about doing that and then they do the very same thing themselves <laughs> or as i read in some of the it's been fun and interesting you know so when we're doing the work with with the animals for 35 40 years 
were vaguely aware of the literature on human beings, but didn't dive into that literature. I, I didn't. But as I worked 10 years to write nourishment, I really got into the literature. And it was very interesting to look as a as an outsider at what they write, what those folks were writing about, thinking about, and so forth. Uh, it was it was amazing. I came away with the conclusion that you could really find literature to support just about any any th any statement you wanted to make oh, out yeah. there from a human standpoint. Well, that's that's part of the problem with human nutrition science, and that's why there's some advantages to doing animal science because you can do different kind of tests and see real results. And the problem is, well, yeah, the different dietary camps, you can prove anything, but I like to stay open, right? I'm always saying, like, I'm just going, this is my operating thesis for now, right? But I, if it changes, then I'm going to go with the new science. And that's how you know if you have an ideology or you have science. So a good example would be vegans. Vegans have, it's an ideology, if they, they don't care about new data. They don't care about changing it. They, they've made up their mind that it is unethical to eat animals and, you know, and it's based on animal rights and that's, you know, their opinion. But it's not that their ideology, it is an ideology. It's not a scientific reality. And then I'm over here trying to just say, well, let's, if something changes, right, I, I have changed my views over the years. And, uh, you, you, that's how science is done. Is it's not based on ideology. It's just based on a, the newest data you have. And the, so, anyway, well, I want to get more specific too because. Uh, Thing about what you just said, right? Yeah, I'm sure. With I, I'm with you on that too. And you know, well, I can very much appreciate, and I imagine you can too, why a vegan would would be. Um, you know, there's various reasons, of course, why a person w would become a vegan. Um, but I think one of the things I think about a lot related to animals and plants both is to realize, and we don't need to dwell on this, but to realize that, that plants and animals both are conscious and they're sentient. They're, they're conscious and sentient. And then I think out of that to re come to appreciate that all life is sacred and then to, to treat life in that way. And certainly we can relate perhaps more to an animal with the big eyes and you know that they, they they behave more like we do but when you get into the literature on plants and you realize all the senses that they have and these secondary compounds we were talking about how they become the eyes the ears the nose the mouth and the relationships that they create and you realize these these things are conscious and they're sentient they're simply working on different different time scales and so forth perhaps than, than than we're used to they're a little bit more in slow motion but to me i think the the point is to realize that all life is sacred and then to start to work with life in in that in that way whether it's plants or animals and to treat it all with with respect realizing that our lives are, are ultimately linked to the lives of these other creatures to their health and well-being and so i just want to put that in as a as a uh, yeah. not related to what you'd said. Well, no, it's true. And I've seen some of these new studies come out. There's so much we don't know about food, which is something we can get into about the metabolomics and stuff that St Stefan Van Vliet talked about. There's so much we don't know about the compounds in meats, even that there's secondary compounds. There's all these 70,000 compounds. But there's so much we don't know about plants, how they work, how they communicate, how they, yeah, they can sense what they need and they can put out all these messages to get those things that they need. And I, yeah, I, I just love that. It kind of pokes holes in that whole vegan concept of <laughs> that we, we should not kill animals and that, well, everything's living and there's a circle of life and, and all that stuff. But I, I want to talk more about just a one more maybe specific study that you've done because I think they're so cool and that you let the animals speak to you, right? And, and the one with uh, the, you know, the straw and the different energy sources. What's one more? Because I, I remember hearing about one that I think you were involved in where the animal was deficient in a certain nutrient or mineral and then you had like sort of blinded or whoever the study uh, conductors were had a had different feeds that one had that nutrient and one didn't, but they tasted the same, theoretically. 
but they knew which one to go for. And so just tell me a little more. I love the specifics of, of these animal studies. That you... Well, let's take phosphorus for, for an example. Let, let's take that and we'll, we'll develop a little bit. So in all the years that we worked at our facility, it was called Green Canyon, and all the years we worked at Green Canyon, we never saw an animal that was deficient in minerals, including phosphorus. We just, you know, they did, that didn't happen there. But when we started studying minerals, uh, started with sodium and calcium and phosphorus and on and on and so forth, um, we were making, putting animals on diets that were deficient in particular minerals. So we did that with phosphorus. And, uh, and then we would, would offer them a flavor, <clears throat> for, let's go back to the straw, for instance, and we'll give them flavored straw for a, a morning meal, half an hour, let them eat apple flavored straw. And then after they eat apple flavored straw, we drench them with, with sodium. Again, we put a stomach tube down them and we, and we put the, the, uh, the phosphorus, I'm sorry, put the phosphorus in there, put it right into the gut. Does that make sense? Mm -hmm. And then the next day we, we offer them uh, maple flavored straw, but after they eat the maple, we, we drench them with water. And then the next day we do the apple, drench them with phosphorus and so forth. So we do that for a few days. And then we simply <clears throat> offer them a choice of apple and maple flavored straw and see what they prefer. And the group, so we'll have two groups making it more complicated here, but we have two groups. The group that got the, <clears throat> was drenched with phosphorus after they ate apple flavored straw, hands down prefer apple flavored straw to maple flavored straw. The group that got <laughs> drenched after they ate maple flavored straw. So that's the way we used to do those those kinds of things was simply to um, give them a flavor, a flavored food that, that didn't have what they needed in it, didn't have phosphorus, high levels of it, and then <clears throat> ask the question. But here was another interesting sidelight of that. When we made, were making the animals deficient in phosphorus, we had 24 animals and they were penned individually and we had assigned the treatments at random to individuals of what they would get. And half of the animals were being made deficient through their diet, the other half weren't. But the group that was on the diet that was deficient in phosphorus, their blood phosphorus levels weren't dropping. And we, at first we couldn't figure out what's going on. And we did, we just started watching what they were doing. And what they were doing is sticking their heads through the fence and they were eating the feces of the sheep that were phosphorus replete. So there you go, you know, and that, that illustrated what happened, you know, as an animal becomes deficient uh, in a particular nutrient, they they in ways start to become averse to the diet that they're eating. It becomes like a like Paul Rosen, this fantastic uh, researcher who who did all the work with with uh, rodents and humans over over his career. Michael Pollan, the Omnivore's Dilemma. That's where he got the title of that book. It was a paper Paul Rosen wrote, and he gave great homage to Paul. But you know what Paul would say is that those diets become like like slow acting. Uh, toxic things. And so animals start to avoid the diet that they're on and they start to sample new and unusual foods. So that's where you'll get animals eating bones, which we know with phosphorus, that's a good sign of a phosphorus deficient, eating, eating bones, or in our case, eating feces. And so eating those feces is what was enabling them to, to not become phosphorus deficient. So we said, okay, we can easily rectify that. We split the groups up. We put the one group in a different place. The first thing that the deficient group started to do was eat the feces of uh, <laughs> that were on the place where we put them. But you know, so there they they'd learned they'd learned how to rectify that deficit by by doing that that behavior. Um, so and we were always uh, from the beginning. I think back to to uh, when I was working with goats in southern Utah and watching them do things that they weren't supposed to be doing. Just to, and I've often thought, you know, it's those, it's those quote, weird behaviors 
that are really give you the insight. That's what to be following. You know, when you see animals doing something strange and unusual, it's going to give you some, uh, for instance, goats eating wood rat houses, which relates to, to this topic of deficiencies. Um, down there on this black brush dominated landscape, black brush is not a great source of nutrients. And, uh, and <clears throat> we had goats down there and the goats in one pasture, we had goats on six pastures, Goats in this one pasture started to eat these wood rat houses. And you think, why on earth are they doing that? Well, you look at that house and down there, the houses were made of densely packed vegetation. And then for siding, they put bark from juniper trees. So they're pretty neat looking, <laughs> big houses. But you strip the bark away, which they've done, and you see that densely packed vegetation. You see there's different rooms to the house. One of the rooms is the bathroom, bathroom soaked in urine. That vegetation-soaked urine becomes a non-protein source of nitrogen that really helps their rumen microbiome to function. And so those animals that did that after three months down there were in much better body condition than the goats on the other five pastures that hadn't done that. So then you think, okay, why didn't the goats in the other five pastures do that? Why They had plenty of wood rat houses. They could have done that, you know, but only this one group. And I often tease people, well, the Einstein of the goat world was obviously in that <laughs> figured out, you know. However it happened, but social creatures being social, um, then they, they all picked up on it. So they were all eating. There wasn't a mm. wood rat house left in that pasture by the end of the study. And so you think it's those... Those, and then I often think, whether it's insects or birds or fishes or mammals or primates or humans, you know, it's how do creatures figure things out? And then when they do figure that out, in social creatures, it can become a part of the culture of the knowledge of the group that becomes invaluable. And uh, so I used to just be amazed at how some of those things would happen and then at what it meant i'm thinking now uh, i'll give you one more example of <clears throat> some studies that were done at the u.s sheep experiment station in dubois idaho it was the the station that studied sheep on a national level and they had some five thousand sheep up there and years ago they wanted to see identify a subgroup of those sheep that ate a lot of sagebrush sagebrush mm -hmm. is a plant that's really dominates out here in the great basin and it can take over landscapes as a result of our mismanagement. But they thought, you know, if we can get a subgroup that eats sagebrush, um, we can use them to reduce abundance of sagebrush on the land we had. And so they used fecal analyses to identify sheep that ate a lot of sagebrush, looking for fragments in the feces. And they selected a group that ate a lot of sage. And we were all thinking, based on other studies in wildlife, that this was a physiological ability to detoxify the terpenes that are in sagebrush to detoxify and eliminate, which we know that happens. But come to find out another year or so later, they published a paper that said the sheep that, had that were doing that had figured out that if they ate an appetizer of this shrub called bitterbrush, they could eat far more sagebrush. So that's what they were doing is mm. using bitterbrush to help them eat the sagebrush. Bitterbrush contains tannins. The tannins bind with the terpenes in sagebrush, so they aren't absorbed into the body, rendering a, a harmful mm -hmm. effect. And so there you go. And that's another, that's a learned behavior that was a part of the culture of that, that group, you know. So you can go on and on, but oftentimes when I read in the ecological literature of some really innovative, interesting thing that creatures do, and when I hear people say, well, it's, quote, just in their genes or talk about it in that way, I think, no, not necessarily. They some some one of them figured this out and now it's become I'm rambling, but I'm thinking of oh. a video I'd like to show a short one on oyster catcher. Uh -huh. It's there at the at the at the side of a water body <clears throat> has this piece of bread and it's putting it in the water and then it grabs it with its beak, pulls it back, putting it out. And you think, what on earth is this oyster catcher doing? Until then, finally, it puts it out, wham, grabs. It's not grabbing a piece of bread anymore. It gets a fish. And so 
there you go. You know, that's another innovation. The oyster catchers don't come knowing to catch fish with bread, right? But they can learn. They can learn how to how to do those kind of behaviors. So it's uh, to me, it's it's uh, all that's fascinating. And you think from insects right on through to 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 we humans, you know. And you're talking about your trip to Africa. And I'm, I have no doubt it. I, like the trips I've made to Africa, absolutely fascinating, and you learn so much. But you know, those people are still very much linked with their landscape and that knowledge of uh, of how to what and what not to eat, where and where not to go. All those really functional links with landscapes, they still mo- mostly have those. Huh? Although I read oh. when I was writing nourishment, I read about how. In some of the some of the tribes, the young people were really being lured away from from that traditional knowledge of, you know, your knowledge of two hundred different plant species and how they how you use those and how to help you survive in uh, in in times of drought. I was reading about that and how the one group still really knew how to do that, and the other group was losing that that knowledge, you know, of how how you make it through the hard times. Well. I'm glad you brought it back to Africa because I, yeah, humans have this, humans have this, okay. Humans are the same intelligence. We have the same brain power. We have the same IQ for, I don't know, a million years. And we've just used it in different ways, right? And that the people, our ancestors and the people who are still doing hunting and gathering and native living still have this knowledge. They just, instead of using iPads and computers, they know about, their surroundings and it's a lot of trial and error they, they were doing science this whole time the observational method of science and i love always connecting back to weston price and how he traveled around and he found all the different groups and they all had the same practices around pregnancy they're like we need the mother to have the most nutrient dense foods and they'd give them the liver like why did the, all the tribes eat the liver like you know they open up the animal and eat the liver raw why did they do that well they they figured it out through the the observation the trial and error humans are geniuses even okay here's another one that relates back to the sheep in africa we went to see the chaga so this is a, a fourth group that i didn't mention earlier that they're up in the mountains in kilimanjaro and they live in this hobbit paradise type of place it's like this lush jungle and they have cows they have different animals up there and all these plants and they and they do really well and they have this tradition of of drinking this banana beer every sunday and what they do is they ferment the bananas and they add in wormwood, right? So they add in the wormwood. And, and I went with Mary Ruddick, who I've interviewed many times on my show, and she's an amazing, amazing person and knowledgeable about this stuff. It's like the wormwood, this helps them. So they had this, they built this tradition around drinking basically something with wormwood that this is how you prevent parasites, right? If you, if you get a weekly course of wormwood, you're not going to develop parasites. And they just figured this out. So for them, it's just this fun tradition. And we got to drink the banana beer with all the old timers and we sang and it was amazing. But deep down, it was a tradition of health that they learned intuitively from nature. Yeah, absolutely the case. Absolutely the case. And you think of that knowledge, that that tremendous knowledge that's been acquired over over many, 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 many generations. And that's all uh, a part of the knowledge of the group. It's a, it's a wonderful thing. When you say wormwood, I'm thinking often that's a that's a common name for sage for what I was talking about is sagebrush and the terpenes. And you're right on the self medication and internal parasites. We did work uh, in the U.S. and with colleagues in Israel showing that that uh, that terpenes can reduce internal parasite loads and tannins and terpenes and so yeah same thing right and then it becomes a part of the i wrote a paper actually recently with with a colleague in israel he's retired now as i am and we're both older and he wanted to write one on culture in goats on culture in goats and so we we wrote a paper and uh it was good, great fun to write that and talk about the kind of things that we're talking about right now. You know, it becomes a part of the culture of the group. And when you when you allow that to, to happen, um, animals become very self-sufficient. They, 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 they're able to ma- make their own way. When you break down culture, um, that, then you make up those kind of costs with... Uh, 
in our case, with fossil fuel intensive kind of practices of one sort or another, we've we've made up. Yeah. And antibiotics and antihelmetics and all those kind of things too, right? That that uh, on a, on a natural diet, as we're talking about, there's there's not a need for those. I have a friend, she's 86 years old now. She was a pharmacist. In fact, she's the daughter of I mentioned the ranch, starting out on the ranch, daughter of of Henry DeLuca, who I worked for, and I met her years ago. She and her husband young family would come and we'd move cattle in the in the high country but she's a pharmacist and we went to ireland together a few years ago and uh one of the castles they had medicinal garden and that's where she and i spent all of our time was looking at that medicinal garden and all the different plant species that they used to grow and use for medicine and she was saying you know back when i was a young pharmacy student we had to take classes in uh in in plants and plant plant uh, plant me- plants as medicine and stuff she said that that's gone now from the curriculums but you know fundamental that's where the medicine was and still does come from in part huh well yeah i mean a lot of pharmaceuticals are pharmaceuticals are just made from plants and you know um i want to get to more, back to one more study i'll see if you remember this one because I think these are so interesting, all these little studies that show, they illustrate so many of these points that we're talking about, but hearing about them specifically about this animal behavior is so interesting to me. Is a, a livestock were gaining the same weight on different, or different amounts of weight on different diets when there was a pre-mixed feed, but then if you split up the ingredients, they would go for the ingredients that they needed. Do you remember this one? Yes, oh yes, I do very well. We did studies with sheep and cattle both, the the one that you're referring to was with cattle and you know when when livestock go into feedlots typically they're um, over the course of time that they're in there they'll be put on to what's referred to as a total mixed ration and what what happens with those is that a nutritionist will formulate a ration um, that's designed to meet the needs of the average animal in a particular subgroup of of animals. And I have great respect, let me say this too, for for feedlot nutritionists, I've worked with with folks there and their knowledge and and, you know, just what it took for them over the years to figure out uh, so much about nutrition. So let let me just make that that Mm -hmm. clear up front. But so what, that's what what they get then is, uh, um, it's then what you do is you grind and mix the ingredients uh, in this ration, and that's what the animal gets offered. So we said, well, what hap- What would happen if we feed one group of animals a total mixed ration, but let's feed the other group of animals the the subcomponents that went into that ration? I think in our case it was alfalfa, corn silage, barley, um, corn you know, really pretty high energy uh, grains in there. And so that's what we did. And in this particular case, given what foods we were offering, you know, we found that the animals given a choice actually ate less food than the ones that were given the total mixed ration, but they were growing at the same rate as the animals. So so they were, they were able to do just fine, even though they were eating less food. And then Ooh, after we slaughtered yeah. them and look at carcass characteristics, there was no difference in carcass characteristics. So what we what we um, hypothesized from that was that the animals on the total mixed ration were over ingesting probably over ingesting energy to meet needs for protein that was in there in amounts that were too low for um, for some of the animals in the group. When we looked at protein to energy ratios for every individual there, that, that's what was amazing because the ration was formulated for the average individual. But when we looked at the, the ones given a choice, some individuals were above that line, others were below the line. No animal was the average, no animal was the average individual. And uh, so, it 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 illustrated a couple of things one is that it's impossible really to formulate a ration for the average individual each individual is so 
different. And we'd show this over and over again, offering animals choices and just looking at what individuals did. They, they, they vary so much in terms of their needs for nutrients. Even if they get the same sex, age, breed, they, they simply aren't the same. And we know that for us, each one of us is so unique. Bloodhound can track us by our odors. We can be identified by our fingerprints. And if you look internally at our organs and organ systems and how they function and their needs, we're each, we're each really, really different. So recognizing that individuality is a wonderful thing. What it meant in our study though, was that it cost far less, far less um, in terms of dollars and cents to feed the animals that were given the choice because they ate so much less of the food. So that, uh, that was really, and, it wasn't what we thought. We thought if we give them choice, they'll probably eat more. They'll really like, you know, they'll eat more food, but they, they didn't. They, in, in our particular case, given those, that combination of foods, they, they ate less. And what was amazing was no two, no two individuals ever selected the same combination of foods and no individual ever ate the same foods from day to day. They varied it, varied it, varied it. And, there's a lady named Clara Davis who did studies with, with infants given up for adoption years ago, uh, back about 100 years ago in the early 20s. And uh, when we started reading about her studies and reading some of what she'd written about those, those little kids, they were giving them choices. So they have these kids given up for adoption. They have like, I don't remember, 15 kids that they've studied for six years every day measuring what they ate. Um, but when she started those papers, she would say no two individuals ever selected the same combination of foods, no individual ever selected the same foods from day to day. And I thought, my gosh, it's like we plagiarized her, but we'd never even read her work when we were publishing all of our work. It was years later. And I think it was Mark. I trying to think who, who sent me, sent me, uh, alerted me to some of Clara's work. It's been a long time ago, but it's like, wow, this is amazing. I, I wish she was still alive. I would love to have talked to her. You know, we were on the same page exactly. That study is super interesting. I want to go a little more into detail about it because I love that and I was going to bring it up anyway, but I want to go back to animals first because the, the human stuff is so interesting. But back to animals, I this is everything to me. The, the experiment that you just mentioned, how they were eating less but gain the same amount of weight. But a guy on Instagram, some muscle bro on Instagram told me that all calories were the same. What's going on? I thought a calorie was a calorie. How come you scientifically showed that they could eat less and gain the same amount of weight? Okay. <laughs> I, I bring this stuff up a lot because it annoys me. There, the nutrition matters more than calories and different calories provide different nutrition and do different things. And I love, this is such a bigger point that we're working on the film. We work on the Food Life film daily. I know it's taking forever, but this concept is so big. I'm going to get to the point. You get the mixed ration, right? And it's just, it's a certain amount of protein energy. I love that you brought up the protein to energy ratio. I talk about it a lot. Dr. Ted Naiman talks about this a lot, who I had on on my first episode, my first guest. So, Animals we found in all different animals from insects all the way up to humans that we eat for a certain amount of protein and nutrients. And if you give a feed that has a whole bunch of extra energy in, like you're saying, they made an average feed and it had a certain amount of energy and a lot of animals didn't need that much energy. They need more protein. They're going to eat to get that same amount of protein and nutrients. So if the feed is diluted of protein and nutrients, it has extra energy then they will have to eat more of that feed to get to that protein and nutrients that they need, right? And this is what is happening with humans. This is why it's so important to me. This is why I'm going on this tirade and why we're putting in the film. If your food supply is a low protein to nutrient, low protein to energy ratio, and so if you're looking at all the processed foods people eat, they are very low in protein and nutrients and they're high in energy. And if that's what you have to offer, which we'll get to with the study with the infants, the adopt, you know, the adoption infants, if they will choose what they need, right? And so humans will, or humans have a protein and nutrient requirement, and we will eat until we meet that, basically. And people try, you can try with the restrictive diets, and you can talk to the calorie bros about, oh, you just need to restrict calories. 
And, you know, you can try, you can force yourself to be hungry, but really what's going on is you're starving yourself of protein and nutrients and, and forcing yourself to try to just eat less of the same bad food and, and it doesn't work. And that's why diets fail. That's why, because you can't force yourself to just constantly not getting enough, not get enough protein and nutrients. So the food supply well, is all that matters. That's such a huge point, Brian. It's such a huge point. And I'll reinforce it with a couple other things, but I, I think it's it's enormous point. I have a friend, David Booth. He's long since retired now, but he studied humans, and he was showing that that our body has the wisdom to know what it needs in terms of essential amino acids, the protein, you know, proteins, amino acids that it needs and the body will 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 um, will force you to get that in the sense that we're talking about right so if you have a diet that's diluted in terms of protein you'll over ingest energy to give meat needs for protein absolutely absolutely the case um, well that's what the, the the livestock showed too is that yeah. they ate less because they didn't have to eat all that extra energy to get the required protein and nutrients. So they ate less calories, yet gained the same amount of weight. So that's what's going on with people eating a good diet. I keep talking about this sapien diet. What is sapien diet? All it is is correct amount of protein and nutrients, and you're getting less energy, right? So yeah. if you focus, that's yep. why people have weight loss, and they have fat loss. They don't just have weight loss, because weight loss could be muscle. And if you're not getting enough protein, you'll be losing muscle, and there's plenty of studies showing that. And so people are successful with an animal-based diet. You know, well, not it doesn't have to be animal-based in the sense of, you know, carnivore. I'm not in the, the carnivore crowd. I'm in the let's get all, most of our nutrition from animal-based foods because they have greater bioavailable, complete nutrition, all that stuff. Then you end up eating less energy because you're getting all of your protein and nutrients at a lesser caloric load. Yeah. And my my good friends David Robinheimer and Steve Simpson have written a book on that, right? And they developed a high you like the animals. hypothesis as uh, eat like the uh, animals. Yep. Yeah, yeah. Eat like the. Yeah, that's right. That's exactly right. No, it's good. It's a key point, and you know, it takes me back to an old friend uh, named Doc Holliday, who was a holistic veterinarian back before people even knew what that was, actually, ages ago. But it, he tells a story about a farmer named Carl, who was feeding uh, mixed mineral, and uh, <clears throat> is a dairy farmer, and his cows were eating a huge amount of that mineral every day like two pounds per head per day, which is a tremendous over-ingestion of that. And they didn't know what was up, and they decided to uh, try try offering them free choice minerals just to see what, what they would do. And uh, so Carl's putting out these, these individual minerals, and, and the animals are really starting to go for the zinc, and they, mm. they're just eating that. And he it, it tells the story in a really neat way. He's headed across the... the the corral to put the the zinc out and he gets attacked by these animals they knock the feet out of his hand they eat all the mineral the muck everything around and uh, so what it was was that they were deficient in zinc and in order to get the zinc they needed the block was formulated for the average individual right this 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 mineral block they were way over ingesting other minerals to get zinc so there again choice and ability to choose is is huge and having wholesome uh, choices available to enable individuals to meet needs for particular nutrients for self-medication for protein so forth and so on becomes really really important no it's, question it, it's so amazing and to go to animals one more round on the animal side before we go to human side is you talked about giving animals diverse diets and you, you don't really want just a monocrop of grass for a cow to just eat grass only and have just a very limited supply of these diverse nutrients. And you want them, you said before, you want them on a diverse species, like rangeland diet of diverse species. So I just want to connect that to, to my thing I'm doing with nose to tail is we are in West Texas and my ranchers have thousands of acres that they go across and they've been regenerating the land, regenerating the land since the late eighties when they took the Alan Savory holistic management courses, the grandpa. And 
they are getting hundreds of different species. They're eating the most diverse diet possible. And they're these rugged animals. Like you said, too, they, they don't have... They don't have vets. They don't do anything. They just let them be. And they're actually selecting out for the, the most rugged animals that can survive this. And so they have this diverse diet. So it, you, you, don't, it's, you don't want just s some grass. You don't just want cows on a grass field. That's kind of like a human just eating the same thing every day and not being allowed to get the diverse plant uh, phytonutrients and all this stuff that they need and then in turn that gives all the rich phytonutrients in the meat and i'm kind of going into the the studies with van vliet and how many different uh secondary compounds i guess they're known as through all that diverse diet yeah absolutely absolutely the case um you expose animals to a diverse array of different plant species those phytochemicals, uh, secondary compounds or phytochemicals that are in those plants get into the meat and get into the flat fat. And as you talked about with Stefan, you know, they serve as antioxidants, uh, they uh, moderate inflammation and so forth. It's, yeah, so then we, we can really realize that, that the, the health of the animals, what they're eating and their health, ultimately is, is linked intimately with, with our health. When you have an animal in a feedlot that's fed a, a, a much less diverse mix, and a point you made too, imagine yourself, and over and over again this has been shown with them, that you had to eat the same ration that was formulated for the average human day after day after day, meal after meal after meal. You couldn't handle it. Couldn't. It's amazing that they're they're able, but you know there's a lot of issues that that arise with with morbidity and mortality and trying to doctor those animals. They, you know, it's 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 they've they've done a great job of trying to keep animals going and and so forth through that time. But we know there's a lot of issues that arise, and it's it makes a lot of sense, right? I mean, we we couldn't. We would be hating life if we had to do that. And and people are showing there's higher levels of cortisol, which is a hormone linked with stress, fetal, cortis, fe, fecal cortisol, and uh, you know these stereotypies that that animals exhibit. It, it's just it's it's a tough situation for for animals to be in that we put them in. You know, I want to say a word, too, about some studies I was just reading about and a thesis I just read that the defense is later this month out of New Zealand. And I want to, um, so so it doesn't overwhelm people. And we're talking about this really diverse mix of plants on rangelands, 50, 100, 150 guys I work with here in Idaho, 300, 400 species. So, you know, that, that's, that really can occur on, on rangelands that, uh, that are well managed and have diverse mixes. But this study in, in New Zealand was asking simple questions to say, you know, we, we've tended to favor ryegrass and alfalfa over here in monoculture. Let's compare what happens if we offer animals even a choice of three or four other foods in addition to that. What happens in terms of their, uh, how much they eat, how well they produce, their welfare and so forth and those studies are just uh it's amazing just just giving a little bit of choice especially if the choices complement one another um what that does for animal well health well-being and production and you know stefan's going to be looking at meat from those animals it's uh so I, i'm saying that so, so that you know if there's people there that have pastures and they're thinking you know well i've got this monoculture of whatever it is how do I diversify that out? Maybe person doesn't have to think, well, I've got to get 100 species out here, which might be overwhelming. Maybe three to five other ones just as a way to start. Do you know what I'm trying to say? So uh, there can be some huge benefits to animals simply from, from doing something like that. So just I, I get too carried away. I think sometimes no, it... I'm, I'm talking about the tremendous numbers and there's value there for so many different creatures, but but also to just make the point that that even a little bit of diversity, if the plants complement one another, can be quite quite meaningful in terms of 
animal health and well-being, the health, health and well-being of soil, and also greenhouse gas emissions and stuff. Uh, the, all that's being shown in, in studies like the ones I was reviewing. So so a person doesn't have to say, well, you know, yeah. it's all over, what can I do? I'm not going to turn this into 100 species of native plants. But, but you know, we can also think, too, about what were the na native plant species that occurred in the areas where we are and the value of natives in terms of being locally adapted and uh, Jerry Bonetti, do you remember Jerry? I'm not uh, sure. Yeah, he he uh, he died of cancer a few years ago. What wonderful, wonderful fellow! Did so much, really, really good, good practical kind of work. But when we we're starting all our work on on phytochemicals and the value and on and on, I remember he wrote me a letter and we got in touch. But he wrote a really nice article for Acres USA talking about weeds in your pasture and stuff, and that they're not really weeds at all. You should probably be encouraging them because they they are offering a lot for the health of animals. So I need to try to dig that article up again. It, it was he just he got the point about diversity, mm -hmm. and then he was you know talking to to producers and saying you know those things that we see as weeds and this beautiful monoculture. Um, that that ra those raggedy looking weeds and stuff are probably really valuable for the animals on your pastures. I, it, it's so valuable, and I actually just started cutting together some videos of our nose to tail ranchers and talking about how diverse their their lands are and all these benefits. So look those up if you're listening to this on the nose to tail dot org site or on my Food Lies YouTube channel. But it made me think of humans. Where I, I advocate for eating nose to tail, right? Nose to tail is the company, but it's also how you eat, you eat the organs. You eat oysters. So you're talking about just adding three to five extra species in an animal's diet, and it can have huge benefits. That's what's going on when you eat some beef liver once a week, or you eat some oysters once a week. You're getting copper and zinc and all these hard to get nutrients. From these, you, it's not like we're saying, yeah, you have to, your whole diet is liver and oysters, but this is how humans get our full range of nutrition and we don't need a lot. And yes, you can still get your main calories from, you know, your main foods, but it's so crucial, these additions and that we can do that as humans with the most nutrient dense animal foods like liver and oysters, for example. Yeah, that's perfect. You know, that's the... Those are right, right parallel with one another, right? And what you're saying is think strategically about that and which organs, uh, you know, that the organs are important. And that's what I was, a uh, point I was making for the pastures. You know, so, some plant species can really add, add a good deal. And it's clear from the combinations they were looking at that some did more than others. And so, yeah, same idea, right? It's the same idea. It's so it's Absolutely. A well, and then with the phytonutrient side, so my crowd is more on the, the meat side, right? We're like kind of an animal-based crowd, and we're kind of poking holes in some of the plant-based paradigms out there. And I was thinking, researching you, that you, you, you know, the work with Stefan Van Vliet and all this stuff, looking at all the metabolomics and all these 70,000 compounds and the phytonutrients. So this is how our meat always was, right? And this is what you guys found the difference between – Different kinds of meat had different kinds of compounds. So for all of history, we were eating animals that were on past, not pasture, range, rangeland, on you know open ground, open land, eating all the nutrients and plants they needed, getting all the phytonutrients for us, and then translating them into their meat and fat. And we ate that, right? So we had ultimate healthy meat. Now, since most meat people get is from the grocery store, it's from feedlots, it's from chicken and pork that's, you know, from a warehouse, basically. And it doesn't have all these secondary compounds. Okay, so they're not saying about this. So people are, are obsessed with plants. I don't have a problem with plants. I just don't think they're this panacea, you know, magical thing that everyone thinks. Partly, I think it's, yes, if you eat more whole foods and whole plants, you're eating less junk. But also, this is my new thing since I thought of yesterday. So since our meat is so devoid of phytonutrients, then when people eat more plant foods, they get more phytonutrients and they are healthier. So now we think plants are magic, but I think plants are medicine, like you were saying before too, because yes, we, can, we have herbs and we, you know, we could add them to our food for, for taste and there's some medicinal qualities to them, but 
from what I've seen, especially traveling to Africa, they're not eating a bunch of plants. They're eating animals. And yes, of course, if they needed extra food, they would eat some supplementary plant foods and certain times a year, or they would, yes, strategically use certain herbs and stuff into, into their diet, but it, it is not the basis of their diet. And so I was just thinking, what if it's, you know, we're getting the benefits from the plant foods in modern day because our meat is so nutrient deficient with all the phytonutrients. That's a subtle and nuanced point, but it's a really, really important point. That, that's, a, that's just a, a key point to, to realize that. Um, and who, who would even, I mean, if we don't think in terms of linkages that plant diversity is linked to the health of soil, to the health of plants themselves, to the health of the animals that we're eating, and then to the chemical characteristics uh, phytochemical and biochemical characteristics of their meat and fat, and then that that's hooked to our health. You have to be thinking about linkages, and we don't do that, right? I, I, no, I'm not criticizing or anything, but I mean, we we, we just um, I think most people don't don't do that. That's one of the things we what would like to have happen now, right? Is people to realize to realize that, and that meat isn't meat isn't meat. Um, it really is going to depend on 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 the diets of of those animals, as as we've been saying. I, it, it's a it's a huge point, and I don't know your experience in Africa, but I, I'm thinking of one of the times I went there. I had a PhD student from a Africa, Lutando Ziba, wonderful fellow who's head of conservation organization there now, um, and <clears throat> we traveled there. Was it was a marvelous trip. Went went for a conference, but we we he took us to so many places that he knew. But we would eat we would eat at these places where um, they were you know in the in the outback, and it was all wild game. It was all wild game that they were offering, and you could go in and you could say you know I well I want this. You'd pick it. It would have the species and then the marker and there's the steak. I would like this kudu steak tonight or I'd like whatever, you know. That it, but we, we would do that and then we would share stuff. And I'm telling you, the flavors of that was, the flavor of the meat was incredible. It wasn't, you know, I think a lot of times people think of wild animals as gamey. And a lot of that gamey has to do with the way they're killed and handled after they're mm -hmm. killed. You know, we, Stress alone causes dark cutters, right? Temple Grandin wrote about that, all these hormones that get into the meat. But that meat, there definitely weren't dark cutters, and the flavor was incredible. And it's it's that phytochemical richness that's being reflected in the in the diets of those animals. We're working with a person in Botswana who's wildlife ecologist there who's very much appreciates all that we're talking about right now and, and looking at probably going to look at, at some of the game animals over there and, and livestock that are reared on some of the diverse diets with Stefan as part of, of what he's doing. But no, it, it's a key, it's a really key, key point. And, uh, and then to realize how bland the flavor is of the meats that we buy that come through, through the feedlot. And they're bland because there's... <clears throat> really no phytochemical richness in their diets to flavor the fat and the meat. And and then going back to this notion that we talked about, that the, the feedback that you get, so you eat something that's really rich in that sense, cells and organ systems are going to, to know that, right? They're going to be able to forage on all the stuff that's in there. I really think of it that way, too. And then they're going to send signals back to say, this is good, you know, we like this kind of stuff. And that's what I'm hoping as we go along with Stefan's work, you know, we'll move from the metabolomics to the trials. And I imagine he talked about the kangaroos versus the cattle that were were cattle in feedlots, kangaroos on, on rangelands in Australia. And that the people that ate kangaroo meat had very, very low inflammatory response compared to the cattle from the feedlots. So, we want to get into those kind of studies and then get into a little bit longer term trials that, that simply, you know, where you could look at preference in, in ways. It's hard, 
as you were alluding to, it's harder with humans to do some of these studies. You can't put them in pens like we did sheep and uh, or goats or cows and dictate their diets quite so readily. It's it's possible, but you know I think there would be some very 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 interesting things revealed. I'm thinking too of of the studies that um, that I read on. Where, where some of the people that are on plant-only kind of diets, when they look at neural responses to to seeing meat or to, you know, they've had meat in the past, they reveal a craving for meat, not to try mm-hmm. to get into how that works. But but what that could be is that, you know, I think, and this, this is something that's hard for all of us, it, what you, you know, your our experiences influence what we perceive, how we believe, and how we behave at really deep levels. You know, I mean this for me as well as anyone else. And so, you know, you may acquire beliefs. You, you've you read about how horribly animals are, you know, the conditions they're in, in these CAFO situations, and that it, it's not good, and you decide, you know, I just don't, don't want to do that. I don't want to be a part of that, so I'm going to vote with my dollars. But your body may still not be getting all that it needs. And so deep down, there is this craving for something that could meet a need, but you're over the cognitive, rational, analytical part of you, your being mm-hmm. is overriding the non-cognitive, intuitive, synthetic. All these feedbacks happen at a non-cognitive level. You don't sit and think about, well, I'm going to change my liking for straw because it was... <laughs> followed by energy if you're a sheep or whatever, any more than you think about which enzymes to release to digest the food you just ate. These things happen automatically, but they can be overridden by that cognitive, rational, analytical part that that uh, the media and, and uh, you know, all kinds of groups work on. And so you can have this this craving. And I, I've I've talked with people who who have, you know, were, were omnivores at one point and then went went more to herbivore kind of way of living or vegan or whatever. And then then when they have meat again, how how it's just incredibly reinforcing. Well that's the that's the knowledge, the wisdom of the body saying, you know, we, we need this. <laughs> Maybe for different reasons you, you don't don't think don't want to participate in that but we could use some of that you know the cells and organ systems of the body now i'm speaking for cells and organ systems but but you know that's real to me what, what's happening and uh, and how that happens those feedbacks at that non-cognitive intuitive synthetic level that's that is that wisdom and then how do we tune into that as you were alluding to earlier how do we let our bodies come into Tune, tune back into that, especially especially if if you were conceived on reared on an ultra processed diet. Boy, you've got three strikes at least against you at birth. You know that, that's that's a tough one. That's a tough one. And we're seeing seeing that too in a lot of you know young people that are already obese and stuff. That's that's those transgenerational linkages in a in a very uh not not healthful kind of way well yeah you're talking yeah in utero you get this nutrition and from your mother and then yes this can start determining your fate and then of course there always is the 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 logistical part of well that's what if your mom's eating that garbage you're probably getting fed that garbage too you know while you're growing up but yes it it does it does affect you on on a deep level and man there's so many things in utero mother's milk and then mother as a model and what's in your house you're done for you know oh. and we can be thankful i can be thankful anyway that when i grew up that that didn't happen because i would be the same way you know i that i would be the same i mean i would i would be probably eating those kinds of foods and be be really um well you know, not be, as healthy we'll just or, say yeah that. you know you're, you're doing great you're 70 yeah, 70. <laughs> You're doing great. I'm glad. So I'm going to try to wrap up a lot of things right now. So one, we talk about, I, I've interviewed a lot of vegans that talk about the first animal food they ate and how they were lit up. Their body was rejoicing. It was this magical experience. 
a guy, Tim Sheaf, actually had a wet dream the first night he ate salmon. <laughs> because yeah. his body needed the nutrients so bad. He actually, yeah, he had major sexual problems and dysfunctions, and he, it all came back the first day he ate salmon. Um, yeah, yeah, yeah. No, so many stories it. of I this. And I love that, yeah, the, the, the bio, when he looked at the study you mentioned where they looked at their brain chemistry to know that they craved it. So they could try to tell themselves a story to make them not want to eat meat, but they can't hide the the desires of the biochemical desires of the body yeah oh, a absolutely the case and then one can think that we're talking about meat right now one can think that from the animal the domestic or wild animal standpoint or humans in africa or wherever that that could go for for a whole multitude of different kind of things that a body needs from protein to minerals to um, phytochemicals that, that could boost your immune function, that could get rid of internal parasites, that the body knows all of that. And then, you know, if you can, can, uh, can allow that wisdom to be manifest and become a part of the culture, we, you know, in Africa, that would still be in, in many of those tribes, as you were alluding to, a part of the culture, right? A part of the knowledge of that of that that culture. And that that's what hopefully with the kind of programs you're doing and all of us speaking, we maybe get get people to to appreciate that that we do have that wisdom of the body and we, we can take it back, you know, we can mm -hmm. dehijack it, so to speak. We can we can bring that back and it involves a whole suite of things from plant diversity to soil health to health of the animals, wild and domestic to, to our, our health is ultimately linked to the health of those landscapes and the creatures that are on it. Yeah. That's that's it. And what we need to do is is change the food environment and then you can listen to your instincts. So I've talked about this before is, of course, your instincts are hijacked and you can't listen to your cravings anymore. So if someone says, oh, what? I, but I'm craving the Twix bar and I'm craving the pretzels. I'm craving this. Well, yeah, because you, you have to get if you're craving that, that's unnatural. If you're craving liver, that is a natural craving. So that's a big problem is if. So if you can get rid of all the processed foods or if you're craving something and it's a processed modern food, then don't listen to that. But if you're craving a natural food, then you should listen to that because that That's is your right. true instincts. That's so important, the, the distinction you're making and trying to get all the – anything that's processed, get it out of your diet. And <clears throat> for Sue and I years ago um, when we started to think more about all this stuff, we decided, you know – the place to do that's at the grocery store. Don't put it in your ba basket. Do not put it in there because if it comes home, you won't be able to resist it. There's no way you can resist that stuff. So, so start thinking strategically about how you get that, where you go to eat. If you go to places that you're going to do that, don't do it. What you put in your food shopping basket, um, don't let it get in there. I was, we were at the store. I love to do this with Sue a while back. I forget, but we were going through. The, the part that has all the baked goods in it, all those big cakes and all that, you know, that incredible stuff. And <laughs> so had gone to grab something else. So I put a couple of cakes and a bunch of that stuff in the past. And this old old lady was watching me and she, I could tell she had a smirk and Sue came back, what the hell are you doing? And the, the lady's <laughs> watching and she's just laughing. And so I put it back, but it's just, you know, it just, it's teasing, it's teasing, but but it's real. You know, you can't you can't you you can't resist that stuff. It's too much. So you just got to think strategically about how how do you get the junk out of your diet and the wholesome foods back in, and then, like you say, then you can trust the wisdom of your body. But until then, you can't because you can't it's so hijacked. It's just it's gonna you're gonna go. Just like the sheep did for the straw, that video I'm going to send you, mm -hmm. you're going to do the same thing, right? You, that that those ultra processed foods, high high and refined carbs that just give you a, such a, you know, historically in the fall of the year, I often think of this. You know, when there were fruits available and berries and tubers and stuff, uh, you know, the, the the indigenous peoples foraged on that stuff and. 
that would give you those blasts of energy like that at a time when you really want to lay down fat, right? You want to lay down a bunch of fat because you've got the winter coming. You're more like a, a wild or domestic creature that has to make it. But now when you've got ultra processed 24 seven, it's, it's not, not good for us. Not you're, good. You're screwed. Our food environment's screwing us. All right. I'm, I'm definitely in wrap up mode here. I have to wrap up the study with the, the adopted infant. So let's, let's come back around really quickly because we didn't explain it all that they followed around these kids for six years, fed them and they laid out an entire array of different foods and they let this toddler do the choosing and they're all natural foods and they had liver and they had all kinds of weird stuff, not weird, but a full variety of foods. Well, I, I'm thinking weird because they made weird combinations even with those yeah. foods to get what they needed. So kind of wrap that one up, please. Yeah, so that was Clara Davis, and uh, she had these 15 infants given up for adoption at birth. She ran the study for six years, six years. There were 34 foods available uh, seasonally, and so they didn't offer all 34 all at once, but they would offer a good mix of foods that were available seasonally. And then uh, she instructed the people that were helping her, do not give a hint of what, what uh, the, the children should eat. And then she describes... You know, early on, they sampled everything. They would sample, everything went into the mouth, including napkins and silverware, whatever was <laughs> on their little thing. That, but then she said for each each child, they would begin to focus in on a certain subset that worked for them. And that's where we were talking earlier. Uh, no two children ever selected the same combinations of foods. No child ever selected the same foods from day to day, but they all selected a diet that led to, to health. And I was reading some of the papers that pediatrician who was working with her on that study published. They said they'd never seen a healthier set of children ever, you know. So, again, it's it's this idea that there is a wisdom of the of the body that resides in each one. It's unique to each individual in terms of how it's manifest as a function of the needs of, of each individual and, and what what works for them. And, uh, yeah, it was a... It was a really a marvelous study and when you read some of what she said about just the comments the way that she wrote and the things that she would say about those uh the study and the children it, it was uh it was an amazing piece of work i wish she was still still alive she she said in one of her papers that they had hoped and this started you know you think back in the 30s i don't tend to think so much of process back then but she said that had started and they wanted to actually do a study uh, offering the children processed foods as a part of, mm -hmm. of the whole thing. But the, the depression hit and uh, so forth and so on, they couldn't do it. But I think we have a pretty good idea how that experiment. Oh, yeah. Well, that experiment's <laughs> playing out now. Yes. <laughs> it's very obvious. Oh, yeah. man. All yeah. right, here, I gotta, I'll gotta. i wrap up some of my own things here at the end. I'm gonna go back to my new thought about the phytonutrients and meat. And how, yeah, you know, that's why we think plants are so magical. But because I'm kind of observing the carnivore crowd, I'm, I'm sort of in this crowd, I guess. You know, I'm friends with the different carnivore people and all that. And they're doing so well, you know. And, and so meat does have so much to offer. And, and especially if you get it from a source of a diverse rangeland diet. And that I think that's why, you know, some people are doing so well, or even I, I'm, I think I'm doing well on 80% animal based foods. And I don't need, I'm getting a lot of phytonutrients and all these things that I need from the, the well sourced animal foods that I get or, and my nose to tail stuff. And so then, yes, I, and then I fill it in with, you know, I can have some fruit or like sauerkraut or whatever, like, you know, just some of these things. And, and I can be just as healthy, or, well, I think I'm actually way more healthy than this kind of plant forward paradigm where we think we have to get them all. So I love that you and Van Vliet and all these people are doing these studies to show that you can get all these phytonutrients and, and different things in, in meat that animal foods are so amazing and healthy. And I never really pitch my, my company knows the tail. I kind of just always do a soft sell or I don't talk about it much, but I, I think I, well, we actually just changed all the ranchers. And now we are doing all these regenerative practices and getting a, a much better a way of raising animals with a super diverse diet. And so I'm really proud of that. We actually just relaunched it on October 1st. So it is all new. And so, yes, if you can get 
meat from your local ranchers that are doing this, then get that and don't get it from me. Get it from your local farmer's market. And, but just, you know, ask some questions. Like, are you rotating them around? Are, are they using holistic management? Are they getting a diverse diet? And if not, you know, I'm very proud of what we're doing and, and we're shipping it out to the 48 states. And I talked about online about a decentralized food system. And we do have plans to kind of get more decentralized and have different nodes around the country and, you know, have these quality ranchers together and get serve their community instead of shipping it. But, you know, it's, it's, it's actually not the end of the world to, you know, put some meat in a box and throw a little dry ice in there and, and ship it out to people. So I guess that, that is my, my one pitch for, for what we're doing at Nose of Tail. And just, I'm just really happy with my new people and the way we're doing things. So, uh, yeah, that's wonderful, Brian. I think that's, you know, that's, that's the essence of it. And like you say, I've been impressed uh, anymore with how many, uh, when you when you start looking into it, how many farmers and ranchers are producing meat, trying to produce it from diverse kind of pastures, and uh, are are close closer to you than you might ever imagine. I, I, there's just, there are a lot of people here in Montana that are doing that, and so it's it's neat huh, to see more and more of this local. Seems to me that's going to become for a whole bunch of reasons we didn't get into, but. That's going to become more and more critical, huh? Of oh, yeah. foods grown locally and uh, the the beauty and power and of local local communities and trying to uh, to uh, sustain one another. In, uh, yeah, at a local well, level, I think that's going to be really valuable as we go move along here. We, I, I think my crowd at least sees the writing on the wall, and I think you're kind of alluding to different taxes and these big anti-meat agenda really on, on the highest world level uh people know all about this right there's like bill gates buying up the land and he's just talking about how we need to eat fake meat to save the planet we might have to have a whole nother podcast I, i'm thinking we might have to have a part two with you we can get into so many other topics that we miss but the the future yeah, that's a huge one that you're bringing up right now i often think too you know, so you mentioned Africa, and uh, a friend sent me uh, a paper. Well, a friend from Botswana, the the, the ecologist there, that uh, it's it's just a bunch of statements from people around the world and their view of Eat Lancet and so forth. And mm -hmm. it it confirmed in me something I've thought from the beginning that you know it it's really arrogant for to try to dictate what people around the world should be eating, right? I mean, it, it, it totally ignores local kind of cultures and traditions and knowledges. And, uh, you know, one size fits all, as we've been saying over and over again in this podcast, never does. And that includes how you uh, produce, raise, and nurture your own foods. I work with a friend I'm thinking of in Tanzania now who you know, working really hard to try to help help people of that country, but it becomes locally inflected, right? In terms of what your environment, what you've got, where you are, how you do different things, those become local, kind of locally adapted. Like, you know, what's it mean to know the range? And and it becomes to me a quite arrogant thing for, for anyone to be trying to say, well, everybody should be eating this or that or something it's, else, you know? it's uh, I hate I, it. The Eat Lancet people, I hate it more than anything. Yes, their their planetary diet for health, whatever the stupid thing is, it is absurd. It's talking about you know fourteen grams of meat per week, something insane. It they it's a clear agenda. It's it hurts my head. I don't even want to talk about. It. I'm going to get mad because it's so yeah, bogus. We better, we better not. We better not get we, you. We but can't. You know. We can't. We're going to have to do another episode. I've just decided we, we can get into more of this stuff. We can, we, we've skipped, you know, important studies that you've worked on. There's, there's more going on here. Uh, we'll, we'll end this for now. Uh, I love that what's going on in Montana and feeding people locally. And I, I really do want to work on the decentralized food system. That is the future. There, there are going to be crackdowns. There are already things going on where, yeah, the USDA like closed down processing facilities during COVID and like different things have gone on people. I sent out a little post on, on my Instagram and in the caption, I said, Oh, contact me about the 
uh, sustainable food system or, or decentralized food system. I got 600 emails. 600 yeah. people sent me their email address and I'm sending there out that email now. We need this. People know, yeah. and we're going to start it. And I'm going to talk to you after the show about getting some Montana people together and get, you know, let's facilitate them feeding their community. And maybe it could be a node of notes to tail, whatever it ends up being. We need to have this decentralized system where the government can't come in and control it and people can get food and healthy food, which is animal foods and, you know. Oh, uh, so critical, you know, and I'll add, I know you were in wrap up mode. I can't help but add one more <laughs> comment here though. In the years when I was growing up and then the years that I was on the ranch, um, I think of the little community where, where I was raised, Salida in central Colorado, there in the quote, heart of the Rockies, as they like to say in the mountains there. And I think a lot of the uh, of the old people who had come over here in the 1800s from Europe, and they all had fantastic gardens, incredible gardens. They all raised chickens. They all had a hog. Some would have a, a cow or whatever. But um, they didn't they didn't let those traditions that they had acquired from the home countries go over the generations. They they raised their own their own food and it was fantastic. Um, what they did, I laugh now. I think of this uh, subdivision where Sue and I live in Ennis, and uh, the covenants are that you can't have any animals any animals in the in the subdivision. And I think of the irony of that and think about, you know, what really should be encouraged is for people to be growing uh, vegetable, herbal, medicinal gardens, having chickens. And we have chickens. We, it, we, <laughs> we, we, and we're scheming how we, can, how we can raise a lamb or two. We've got only an acre and a half. And, but, you know, um, so supporting local people that are producing but then getting your hands involved in doing that yourself links us back then in very tangible ways to to where we come from, right? To where we could. Oh and, man, and that's all I'm about. It's a spiritual thing as well. I, I I honestly believe it's a it's a spiritual kind of thing. That's a whole other topic to develop. But it's not just physical. It's realizing our linkages with with being basically with all things and uh that there's a lot and those people didn't let that didn't let that go and when when we would butcher hogs on the ranch i think well we did all this stuff had the cow of course of milk cow but when we'd butcher hogs on the ranch there was a whole art of how you did that and how you'd scald it in the cauldron with the chains and then you'd scrape it and then all the organs, nose to tail, like the only thing that gets away is the squeal. Mm. <laughs> I love that. I love yeah, that. Yeah, well, that was that's another way to say nose to tail. The only thing that they'd, they'd get away is the squeal, huh? Wow, that's beautiful. I'm gonna use that phrase now, and uh, we're gonna have to do part two. I yeah, uh, I didn't want to let this cat out of the bag, but you're talking about. The bigger idea, getting back to nature, growing your own food, that that's part of the bigger vision. It's not just decentralized food. We're talking about a new sort of more off-grid way of living. So yeah. I'm going to have to throw in a link. That's to, it. That's what, that's what people need. Nothing's more, I think nothing's more important than trying to get people thinking about the importance of that, especially with all that's happening nowadays. I think that kind of getting more self-reliant again. But oh, and not yeah. only self-reliant, but... It awakens a part of our being that's still there. We'll have people that have no no background in any of this come out, and we'll, uh, we built a little palace for our chickens, a really nice coop, actually, a really nice place, and we keep them in there so we don't too much offend against the covenants that we're breaking. But we turn them out to forage, you know, to go around. We, mm -hmm. we feed them a great diet, actually. Sue's the... But then we turn them out to just forage on this acre and a half. And it's fun. You get on chicken time. And these people who come that have that, they say, oh, it's so cool just to watch those chickens, you know, just to spend some time. I think that's in a way awakening like those people you talked about when they eat meat after not having eaten meat for a long time. It's linking back with something that's deep inside of us, huh? that that our relationship mm. with with 
with all of that. And uh, boy, in our in our world of where where we run so fast, running, 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 that who has time to to stop and do any of that? That's exactly what we need nowadays. Well, we're doing it. Uh, like I said, I didn't want to let the cow the bag. No, we're looking for. We're, we have a lot of things in, in the works outside of Austin. We're looking for a few hundred acres outside of Austin. We have investors. Li- we have all kinds of things lined up. We're not messing around. This is why I moved to Texas in the first place. I didn't really talk about it much. You know, it's like there's a great community here in Austin. But the real plan was to get outside of Austin and back to how humans should live. And there's so many like-minded people who listen to this podcast that I'm sure – um, can be a part of it and uh, and understand that this is where our future is. And we will have, again, nodes. We'll have nodes, and there's a, probably a node going to be in Montana. And I think Rob Wolf's already out somewhere. You know, like there, there's people who are we're getting this started. We're going to connect with people. You can connect with me if you're listening. You want to be a part of this. We, we're looking for all kinds of people. We have some homesteaders who are, are interested in starting to work the land as the first people out there. So, you know, they're going to get on the land early, start working it, start getting the animals in place, and then, you, you know, we'll follow. So this is big. This is huge. I can't, I, I can't believe I'm talking about this. I thought this was going to be a five- to ten-year plan, and it turned into happening already. So it DM me. It needs to happen already, too. Yeah, yesterday. That's yesterday. great. That's great. It needs right. to happen yesterday. COVID stuff woke everyone up to this how important it is you see all this top down control happening you see the like world you know governments trying like well they're trying to create like you know the, this top down like eat lancet the who like all the un like this people see through this that this is uh they're coming for us they want this kind of top down control and we as humans need the opposite we need to govern ourselves on the most local level and um that and and so okay, so I could go on forever about this, but just just DM me, go to Food Lies anywhere. I answer my DMs on Instagram. You can find my email. You can find the landing page that we don't have yet. Maybe I'll include in the intro and the outro of this episode because we are doing this. It started. I'm so excited. You can't. I I seriously can't even sleep. I wake up every night in the middle of the night thinking about this stuff. <laughs> Good for you. All right. Well, thanks, Fred. I can't wait for part two because we can just go on forever here. But for now, take care. Yeah, you too, Brian. Wonderful to visit with you. No kidding. I enjoyed the whole every minute. All right, everyone. I hope you enjoyed this one with Fred. He is a legend. I want to have him on again. There's so many topics we can still cover. Please give this show a review on iTunes or the podcast app. Share with family and friends. Start back at episode one. And of course, go to nosetail.org to get all your great regenerative meats. Check out what else we're doing at saving.org. Support the show on Patreon slash PQman or by joining the Sapien tribe, sapien.org. Thanks, everyone. We'll see you soon.